the S&P 500 had the best week in 2024. In fact, it was a historical moment as it crossed 6,000 for the first time ever. Yet when we take a look at the Real Estate Investment Trust, we see they also had a fairly decent performance, yet Realty Income sitting right there in the middle was in the red. And when we take a look at this company, over the last month, it is down around 6%, giving away a lot of the gains that we had seen this year. So what is going on? We have some bad news to uncover today. We also have some better news, and we also want to understand, is this an undervalued buy, as they've just reported their earnings? So we will also take a look at that latest piece from just this week. Now, first things first, it does essentially have some updates to their price targets, we have pretty much the majority of brokerages giving it around a $64, which is fairly good if you are someone who has been buying when it was around the $50 mark. When we take a look at JP Morgan, they are one of those who are essentially a lot more bullish. They've upped their price target to $67, but they do still hold a neutral rating for the REIT. So we're going to uncover a lot about this company. We're going to look at their metrics as well as our own valuation model. But when we just take a look at the company over the longer term, we can see over the last 12 months, it is still up around 12%, although has massively underperformed the S&P. And if you've been a long-term shareholder, you'd be up around 26%. Now, this company does pay dividends every month, so if you had reinvested, you would be up higher than this percentage. However, do understand, still underform the S&P. And before that massive COVID drop, February 2020, the price at $82, it still has not recovered. We do notice right now it is sitting around the midpoint of the 52-week range. Seeking Alpha, Wall Street, and Quant, very rare on this channel. We get a buy rating from each one of those. And it does, as we said, pay a monthly dividend right now at 5.5% and a P to FFO around 137 which, as we will show you, is lower than the overall industry. Now, as we've mentioned their earnings, we can see over the next four quarters, they are expecting growth to the FFO, which is the funds from operation, something we do look at instead of EPS for REITs. However, we have noticed in their latest earnings, which was just a few days ago, they did unfortunately miss. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But what we also noticed over the last four quarters, they've actually missed on three of them. That is only a 25% positive record, only beating one of the previous four. And we do also see here their FFO is still anticipated to increase over the next full year, lowering the forward P to FFO to around 13. And as we already stated, this is lower than essentially the industry as a whole. In terms of some good news, we'll start there. Well, the Fed did cut just last week by 25 basis points, and that is very positive for REIT as they do take on a lot of debt. And as we have seen from their latest debt summary, this is a company that does hold quite a significant amount. In fact, as we can clearly see here, 26 billion of their debt is fixed which is positive because that's around 97%, which means they don't need to renew anytime soon with the average of their interest rate at just under 4%. And it has more than six years until maturity. In terms of the variable, it is only around 3.4%. So we are noticing that interest rates are coming down, which is a good sign, especially like we said, companies like Realty Income with significant debt. But the one area that we would say is good for this company, they have got quite a number of years before they do need to renew. And hopefully by then, interest rates will come down even further. As we have mentioned before on this channel, essentially this shows us the quarters after the Fed has in fact started to cut the rates that the blue, the public real estate companies like Realty Income tend to massively outform the equity market. So this is one piece of good news that we do want to share today. Then we're going to take a look at their latest investor presentation, try to understand the direction of this company and some other things that I just want you to flag just so you do understand, especially when we do come to our margin of safety later on in the episode. Now, the main thing that we want to point out from this company is that their occupancy is around 99%, which is very important. Maybe one of those metrics you don't look at when considering REITs, but it is very critical to their performance to ensure that their occupancy does stay very high. Realty income is typically one of those that is very strong. The other thing that we want to see here is that their 2024 outlook, they believe that it will be around 4.8% in terms of the AFFO growth. Essentially, like we said, 
That is in comparison to other companies earnings per share, which is fairly strong when we will show you the previous years. It is one of those which we would say is a good year. And then we move on to something that they have kept in from the previous quarter. We have discussed this already, but very briefly in 2023, they purchased around 82 assets and they've now partnered with Decathlon, which is the third largest sporting goods retailer in the world. So that is a very strong sign. Why we like this, what Realty Income are starting to do is move into Europe and expanding through there essentially a large benefit for the shareholder now in terms of as we can see here the decathlon sell leaseback they also want to flag here that there are other areas in europe that they are trying to penetrate and as we will come to show you there are some large brands that you may have heard of that sit within realty incomes tenants now the one thing to consider here is that their client diversification as we can see in fact their top three clients dollar general walgreens as well as dollar tree make up nearly 10 percent of their total annualized rent and one thing that we are struggling with this is that each one of these companies have had a terrible 2024. In fact, 2023 wasn't good either. When we look at Dollar General, they're down year to date 43% trading at their 52 week lows and they are really struggling we've covered this company before on a deeper dive as well as looking at their stores in terms of that reducing we have the same to be said about walgreens in fact even worse down around 66 percent again trading at their 52 week low and dollar tree finally year to date down around 57 percent trading equally at its 52 week low so you do need to consider with Realty Income whether or not these tenants will be issues moving forwards. You could argue there'll be other clients who will come and take that space, but definitely something to flag. We haven't even covered any of these other companies, but these top three, as we said, around 10% of their total rent are made up by struggling companies. So just something that we have to flag and we can see in terms of groceries, they make up around 10%. We have convenience stores. In fact, you could group quite a few of these together. Whether or not you believe these are well diversified, something to consider. But as we have talked about their European diversification, the UK alone makes up around 12%, but no surprises, the US is the vast majority of their top line. Then when we take a look, again, we've showed this before, but just to reiterate, they've brought this into their latest presentation as they do believe it to be important, but they say that their clients are essentially resistant to any changes in the consumer behavior. And that is something that we are starting to see with earnings that have been reported by the vast majority of companies. We are seeing a weakening in the consumer environment. They have less money, they're buying less products, or they're moving away to cheaper alternatives. So again, something just that we do want to flag. And again, this slide is just to reiterate in terms of their investment into Europe, it does seem to be very, very strong year on year. Year to date, maybe it does lack in comparison to the previous years, but it is definitely something very important to Realty Incomes Management. And that is why they have brought this slide in again, just to highlight. Finally, as we did talk about it before, we are just showing you those top five European clients. These are very large names. Unlike the top three that we talked about, like Dollar Tree, like Walgreens, these are very strong in terms of their performances and also in terms of security. We don't believe there are any issues with these companies from the information that we do have. We also want to let you know we have released our latest free weekly article where we talk about two stocks we are buying in November. In fact, every single Monday morning, we do deliver one directly to your inbox where we talk about severely undervalued companies that we believe deserve your attention, as well as what's gone in the market over the last few days. So do click below and you can sign up and read these straight away, where you'll also be able to gain access to 40 undervalued stocks for the month of November. Lots of information, as well as the upside that Wall Street themselves see over the next year. And on top of that, you can grab a copy of 22 dividend stocks that Wall Street believe have the most upside in the S&P 500 right now. So click below, sign up, and you can read straight away. Now we're going to take a look at the updated metrics based on their earnings. And what we can see right now, dividend safety score sits at 80. We have a double undervaluation signal, which we will cover. And they've increased their dividend over the last full year at around 3%. Remember, on this channel, ideally, we want to see 4% just to keep up in line with inflation given the historical inflation rate in the US over the last 40 years has been 4% year on year. Now, it was reaffirmed at the back end of August that this company's dividend is safe, and this ultimately means that a dividend cut is unlikely. 
Now, in terms of the key metric from the last recession, in fact, 07, 09, what was called the Great Recession, they increased the dividend. They pretty much had flat recession sales, which was well above the S&P's negative 12. And they also marginally outperformed the S&P negative 43 versus negative 55. In terms of dividend growth, as we said, 3% over the last full year, 3% over the last five years, and over the last 20 years, if you've been a shareholder, it has increased around 5% year on year. Now, it does pay a monthly dividend. The yield currently sits around 5.5%, and as long as they can, at a minimum, keep up in line with inflation, then that is fairly positive news. And they're also a dividend aristocrat. They've been increasing dividends for 25 plus years, in fact, 29, and they've also been paying a dividend for the last 55 years without a reduction. Now, in terms of this valuation model, this shows us the blue tunnel, which is the expected fair price. And what we see over the last year, severely undervalued, it came up to the lower end of the expected fair price. Now we see it outside giving that severe undervaluation case. Just remember, we're not looking at any of these models in isolation. We will conclude when we come to our own valuation model. And here we have dividend yield theory. This tells us a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. So we have an undervaluation signal here and another undervaluation signal. Forward P to FFO, 13.4 is lower than the five-year rolling at 17. And in fact, it's also lower, much lower than the real estate sector of 17.1. Now, you could argue that companies do deserve to trade at a discount if they are worse off. But that is something we will cover when we do compare some numbers to the overall sector medium. Now, adjusted funds from operation is something we look at as opposed to free cash flow, which we love on this channel, as it is a lot more volatile for REITs in particular. Below 90% is what we want to see. That is what we get every single year. In fact, decreasing from 85 to 75 on a trailing 12 month. So good news, as we said, bare minimum, we want to see increases around 4%. Then we get to the AFFO, similar to free cash flow per share. We want consistent increases over the longer term. That is what we get, $4.23, around $4.30 anticipated over the next 12 months. So that is a positive sign for growth of realty income. And as we mentioned, they are expecting around 4 to 5% for the full year of 2024, which is on the better end of their historical performance, 2% in the previous year, although we do get a nice 9% in 2022. Always important to ensure they are growing that AFFO per share for shareholders. And then when we get to the sales growth, 5 to 10% for REITs, they do that significantly year on year, 22% in 23, 29% on a trailing 12 month. But one thing we do need to watch out for, for REITs and in particular realty income, because they are one of the worst at doing so, are the shares outstanding. Now, we want companies to do share buybacks. However, in the REIT industry, it is the opposite. They will dilute your position over the longer term. And as we can see, main reason for this, they do retain a little of that internally generated cash flow. They pay the majority out as dividends. So what we can, in fact, see 219 to 826 in the last 12 months. That is very rapid. In fact, that is one of the highest in the REIT industry. Just something to flag. Maybe consider in your overall margin of safety. Total sales as well, just to drive home, they are growing very rapidly, just under 1 billion in 2014, 4.08 in 2023. And the way they are able to do this is essentially by issuing equity. So again, you do need to consider all of these different things. In terms of the ROIC, for REITs, 3 to 5%, other companies around 10. Just to give us faith, management are able to effectively allocate their capital. It went to the lows of 2% in 2021. Nice to see it recover over the last two years, although we do want to see it back up to the historicals of around 4%. Nonetheless, 3% is okay, although at the lower end of the target we want. Operating margin, not too bad. A little bit inconsistent, but around the 40% year on year. And then we get to the net debt to EBITDA. Essentially, EBITDA referencing the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Below 5.5 is what we want to see. And the numbers that you can see below reflect the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. Now we focus on this metric because it correlates to dividend safety balance sheet strength, 6.05 in 23, 5.86 on a trailing 12 month. Nice to see it coming down over the next 12 months. This is something we want them to execute on. Ideally, the lower the better will help in terms of dividend safety, as well as just reinforcing that overall balance sheet strength. Now, we've already discussed their top line revenue. And as we can see over the long term, it has seen some nice growth. We said it pretty much increased fourfold from 933 million to 4.1 in 2023. Based on the Q3 report, trading 12 month at around 5 billion, 
does show us that strong growth is anticipated for the full year of 2024. Then we get to the bottom line net income. From a graphical basis, it does look fairly inconsistent with growth just occurring in 21 to 22. When we zoom out, pretty much tripled from 271 in 2014 to 872 in 2023, with only a marginal increase expected on a trailing 12 month. Something though we can wait and see as they still have one final quarter to report. Then we get to the balance sheet. As always, balance sheet strength, health check, total cash versus total debt. What we notice here, cash very, very inconsistent. In fact, it's gone from around 4 million in 2014 and they've just reported a few days ago. We can see it now sitting around 397 million. As we always say though, one number isolation will tell us absolutely nothing, which is why we compare it to their total debt numerically and directionally, which as we can see and typical for REITs has increased over the long term, going from just under 5 billion in 2014 to 27 billion in that latest quarter, as we said just days ago. Something definitely to keep an eye on and that is why we always really focus on that net debt to EBITDA in some detail. Then we move on to the valuation. Now they get a B. Typically we look at the P on a non-GAAP basis. However, for REITs, as we mentioned, we actually need to look at the price to the adjusted funds from operation. Now they get a B minus at around 13.71, sector median just under 17. So this says if you are buying realty income around the $57 price, you are getting around an 18% discount. Does it deserve that discount or it has the market overreacted? Something to consider. We'll look at the growth and profitability now, but as always, we will run it through the valuation model. So in terms of growth, they get an A+. Now we can see across the board looking very strong. AFFO growth over both the last five and the last three years have outperformed essentially the sector median around 121% better in terms of the five year and around 28% better in terms of the three year. We do know in terms of the year on year around 2.04% isn't far off the 2.16 of the sector median and in terms of forward looking 3.41 marginally higher than the sector's 1.62. So it's undervalued in terms of the sector but we are seeing in terms of the growth metrics looking fairly better and then we move on to the profitability where they do get an A. In terms of the AFFO, adjusted funds from operation as a percentage of total revenue, A+, plus, 89%, significantly better than the sector median at 41%. We also notice the cash from operations, 3.36 billion over the last 12 months, much, much better than the sector median at 238 million. So a quick recap for this part of the analysis, a buy rating, as we said, quite rare on the channel, right across the board, we have a B on valuation, A plus on growth, with an A on profitability. This part of the analysis, in terms of insider ownership, remember we want to see our insiders buying or selling. We noticed two insiders selling around $882,000. This is just over the last 12 months. However, in the more recent quarter, we see no movement. You'd have to go to Q3 to see around $411,000 worth of shares sold. Now, this was from one of the directors on the 11th of September. We would argue outdated information is there though and that netted her around 107,000. Now we don't see this as a bearish signal. Insiders sell many reasons, personal, financial as well as others. We want to identify here insider buying which we haven't seen. We then move on to institutional ownership that comes to around 71%, around 1.5 billion worth of sales over the last year. Same time frame, a lot more buying, just under 5 billion and we do also notice in the more recent quarter institutions have been buying 479 million versus 103 million sold. So clearly institutions are very bullish, buying more over the last 12 months and in the more recent quarter. Now two more things before we do jump into that valuation. Let's see how they performed against the overall sector. We have comparatives here, Simon Property Group, Kimco, as well as others. I'm sure you've heard of the vast majority. In terms of total return, including dividends reinvested, which for realty income is on a month by month basis, They've actually performed the worst over the last year, but what we do note, the industry as a whole hasn't been too bad at all. In fact, some companies up very strongly, 40%, 44%, 64%. And then when we zoom out to over the last five years, we can see realty income's return has actually been negative. So if you bought this five years ago, you've reinvested that dividend every single month, you would be down around 1%, not great at all, but we can see pretty much every single other REIT has been positive. And over the last 10 years, when we zoom out even further, quite interesting with it being the worst performing over the last year and five years, over the last 10, it has been the best at around 105. 
Now, you might think this is a very good performance. You might think very poor. Regardless of what you think, past performance does not define the future. Then we move on to just showing you against the S&P. Realty income has underperformed over the last year, has underperformed over the last five years, and has underperformed over the last 10. Now, you could also consider a low-cost ETF like VO if you believe that it will continue to outperform over the longer term. But I understand there are also investors who like royalty income because they like to use that monthly dividend for their expenses. But again, just different things we do want to flag. Now, let's jump into the valuation model. As always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided. Smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Our intrinsic value of $69 is from the average of these three models. Now we're gonna show you very quickly how we got to these prices. First one, multiples valuation. We have the P to AFFO multiple. The average, we have that of realty income. And we can see our first undervaluation, quite severe. In fact, $80 intrinsic value, market price $57.50. Just remember though, we're not looking at any one of these models in isolation. We then have the dividend discount model, average growth around 3.14. So we've gone there or thereabouts moving forwards, giving us our second undervaluation signal, intrinsic value $67. We then move on to the DCF model, free cash flow year on year, average growth 20%. We've gone for eight in line with analyst targets. With the discount rate of 8%, we get the present value of future free cash flow and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by the shares outstanding. And as we can see here, a marginal undervaluation signal, meaning three for three, all showing undervaluation, and the average today coming at $69. Now remember, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running through your own numbers, whether it's for realty income or any others. Now what we also like to do on this channel is run a margin of safety, where we do start off with 10%, execute on that if it meets our three golden criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, and good forward-looking data. Now if you believe that in today's episode, well, a buy at $62, and then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. And what we in fact see, it isn't at the 20% level just yet. Right now, royalty income, we see a 15% MOS with Wall Street around 66 on average and upside of 15%. So is it a buy, hold or sell? You're getting a 15% MOS, you're getting 15% upside. Do give us your thoughts below. But if you wanna see at a 20% MOS, a buy at around $55, at 25, around 52, and at 30%, around 48, 49. As we said though, in today's episode, at least a 15% MOS, 15% upside, buy, hold, or sell. Give us your thoughts below. If you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter below. New copy coming to your inbox tomorrow morning. And as always, come and join us in the Patreon where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells. Have a great day and we'll see you all on the next one.